All right. Oh, one more person. We'll let Lisa in. Well, thank you everybody for being here. I want to get started because we're keeping right to a half an hour today. So um, I'm excited to have two very important leaders from Mass Health and the Executive Office of Health and Human Services, Dr. Ryan Schwartz and Heather Rossi. Um, but before I turn it over to them and, and introduce them, I just wanted to talk uh, a, a little bit about what's happening on the, the state government affairs side, um, because we got news late last night that the economic development bill is moving in conference committee, and um, it actually should be in front of the governor, hopefully by the end of the week. Um, and I'm really happy to say that our advocacy was definitely successful. Um, so many of you uh, took the time to take action, contact your reps and senators, and tell them how critical it was for that workforce chapter 257 funding to remain in the economic development bill like it was at the end of the formal session. Um, and it remained in there. We have 225 million total um, that is gonna stay in the economic development bill and go directly towards our workforce. We will break that down as to exactly what that means because there's kind of two chunks of money and one is going to be um, directly towards rates and others, uh, the other chunk is a little bit more towards a one time, um, uh, almost like an ARPA additional funding. So uh, we'll break that all down and tell you exactly how that works out. Um, and I hate to make announcements before things are final, but it, it looks like it's really going through. Um, and we have one other piece of good news. Some, some of our bills are moving in the informal session, which is um, you know really difficult to do, but stay tuned to the ARC because we may have some announcements on supported decision-making later today. So very, lots of very exciting things. Um, but I'm really, really happy uh, today to talk about the new uh, demonstration waiver, the 1115. Um, there's a lot to know about this. <laughs> and I'm so happy that we have the experts here to break it down. Um, and I just want to introduce uh, Dr. Ryan Schwartz. He is the, the Senior Director of Delivery Systems and Policy. Um, and Heather Rossi is the Director of Eligibility Policy. Is that right? Yeah, okay, great. Okay, so I think I have some slides and I'm just gonna um, actually uh, turn it over to, to turn it over to Ryan or start with, with you. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, good to meet everybody. I'm Ryan. Um, we can keep this relatively informal, but uh, the goal was to try and give a, a quick overview of the 1115 demonstration extension. Um, and to, to just caveat this, it's huge. Um, I've tried to do the whole thing and it normally takes me about two hours to go through in a, in a webinar. Um, so we're just going to hit the high points and we're going to try and highlight in particular the areas that are probably most uh, relevant for, for, for what you're interested in. But um, there's a, a lot more kind of behind the scenes. Um, Mar, do you want me to um, project or are you going to bring up something? No problem. I can pop this up right now. Just sure. to make Great. it a little bit easier for you. Um, there is a, um, a bigger version of this deck that is on our website um, that includes more detail. Um, we tried to chop about half of the content and, and we're only going to go through about a quarter of that. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll try and hit the, hit the highlights. Please feel free to, to jump in with questions as we go, though. Um, you can go to the next slide. Yep. There we go. So just to, to level set and um, kind of put some context behind all of this. Uh, going back five years now, in uh, 2017, our, our last 1115 demonstration extension uh, was approved and then really kicked off in 2018. The 1115 is, is a waiver of uh, Social Security Act Section 1115, which basically enables Massachusetts or any other states to do innovative, uh, new, uh, non-typical, atypical uh, Medicaid policy. Massachusetts has been using an 1115 demonstration since 1997, so this is a, a long-running thing for us. Um, the 2017 through 2022 demonstration was 
probably one of the most significant in terms of over overarching delivery system reforms. Um, the, uh, as many of you are familiar, the ACO program, the Accountable Care Organization program launched as a part of this most five year, uh, most recent five year demonstration. Um, I, my team oversees the ACO program and, and the, the waiver. So happy to dive into some of those details, but we'll, we'll just hit the highlights. Um, and uh, over the last five years, we now have uh, just shy of 90% of managed care eligible lives enrolled in uh, accountable care organizations. Uh, that's kids and adults. Uh, and many of your uh, members and constituents um, are, are served uh, every day through, through uh, currently 17 ACOs uh, across the state. Uh, and um, the, overall, we, we feel like the, the last five years was, was a huge success and a huge step forward for MassHealth, but it also taught us a lot about some of the areas that uh, there's still real areas for, for growth and opportunity. Um, and so at the bottom of this slide, we, had, we are the five kind of high level goals for what we proposed to CMS for this next five year period, 2022 through 2027. Uh, and we'll hit on uh, each of these uh, in this in this presentation, but just to hit them at a, at a very quick level. The first is that we believe value based care is absolutely the right path for Medicaid. Um, and uh, we are doubling down in every way, shape and form on a value based platform, primarily through our accountable care organization program. However, there are a whole range of value based uh, contracts and arrangements um, across the Medicaid agency that, that are similar um, and and. Uh, in a similar philosophy. Um, number two is that uh, despite uh, some, some important progress over the last five years, we remain dramatically underinvested and uh, ineffective and inefficient in our primary care, our behavioral health systems, and our pediatric focus. Uh, and I think building out the ACO program taught us and highlighted some of these areas even more uh, prominently than we had, uh, we had been familiar with previously. And so uh, a very strong commitment in this next five years to focus in particular on these three, and that's both delivery system as well as investment and, and payment reform. Number three is a, a strong focus on health equity. Uh, this was actually a core focus of the last five years. Um, however, if we've learned anything during the last five years, it's that we hadn't been focused on it enough. And uh, so this uh, demonstration will really focus and center health equity much more as a core pillar of the demonstration through, uh, through all of what we're doing. Um, we'll talk about that, some of those details, but um, very significant, substantial investment and um, precedent setting authority on the federal level that is now um, actually teeing up a, a number of demonstrations in other states as well. Um, four, uh, all of you are very familiar with this one, but the 1115 is, is a core pillar in terms of how we finance our safety net uh, throughout the state. Um, and uh, we are expanding that, that financing and support in this next five-year demonstration and continuing to, to robustly uh, support uh, many of our, our safety net institutions through the waiver. Um, and then five is, is on coverage, and uh, Heather is going gonna, is gonna to hit on this piece in particular, some, some exciting areas um, where we are updating a number of our eligibility policies and, and expanding uh, coverage. So let's get into the details. Um, do you want to hit the next slide? Sure. Um, you might be going to do this in your details, but could you just do a quick definition of value-based care in case people... Sure, don't... absolutely. Thank you. Sorry. Um, too much jargon. So when we say value-based care or an accountable care organization, what we mean is, is that we are, as the state, as the payer, we are holding provider systems accountable for cost, for the amount of cost that they expend, uh, for the quality measures of uh, the members that they serve and for member experience. So for each of those buckets, we have very clear benchmarks and indicators that we measure, um, including the experience of care provided um, by all of the providers that, that um, we contract with, as well as overall their population health outcomes um, and their quality measures. And value-based care means you pay for what you get. Um, and so a percentage of their payment, um, it's, it's not quite this straightforward or simple, but uh, a percentage of their payment is contingent upon meeting uh, quality measures, patient experience measures, and, and cost benchmarks. Great. Um, so with that said, great segue into uh, goal number one. So if it's if the text is ghosted out, it means I'm going to try and skip over that just to, to get through the highlights for where I think is probably most uh, salient for you guys, but obviously a lot more here. Um, so we are currently re-procuring the ACO program. What does that mean? So the Accountable Care Organization program is kind of the, the, the pillar 
of uh, Medicaid's value-based strategy. These are 17 healthcare organizations throughout the state currently that are contracted on quality, on cost, and on member experience. Um, those contracts were five years. They expire on December 31st of this year, and we are uh, in the midst of re-procuring and actually finalizing that procurement this week, uh, such that beginning on April, in April of 23, we will have new accountable care organizations uh, with new updated contracts. And uh, we could spend a lot of time talking about those contracts, um, but the, the summary is that they mirror the 1115's goals uh, very closely. And we've used this re-procurement as an opportunity to uh, uh, increase the expectations and the requirements on our ACOs in particular around primary care, behavioral health, pediatric care, uh, and health equity. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those, but that's why a re-procurement was very important in our minds um, to align uh, our contracting, which is upwards of $9 billion a year um, through these ACO programs in, in healthcare spend. Uh, to, we wanted that those contracts to be closely aligned with this next five year, um, 11, 15. So. Um, similarly, um, many of you are probably familiar with our community partners organizations. Our community partners organizations um, provide uh, wraparound services for some of our most complex uh, medically and or socially complex members. Um, in two big buckets, we have behavioral health uh, community partner organizations and long-term services and supports community partner organizations. Um, we are also re-procuring this program and for a similar reason. Um, we will be increasing the expectations of our community partner organizations. We'll be more closely aligning those contracts with uh, some of the value-based care uh, goals of this next demonstration and uh, ensuring that they are focused on uh, some of our core priorities uh, as a part of the ACO program and the 1115 demonstration overall. Um, a couple of things to highlight here for, for some of your members and constituents in particular. Um, the long-term services and supports community partners are typically the CP organizations that serve kids. Um, BHCPs um, pretty much strictly just serve adults. Um, both do serve um, many individuals with autism and or intellectual disabilities or other disabilities. Uh, and in this next contract, um, their expectations uh, for many of those care management and care coordination services will be uh, increasing. Uh, the expectations will be ratcheted up in a way that we hope is meaningful um, and will result in both better care for those members, but also uh, more streamlined, coordinated care. Um, and a, a core part of the focus in this next contract will be focusing on that coordination aspect, which uh, we know has been has been challenging um, in the first few years of this program and um, is a is a key focus as we move ahead. Wow, that that makes so much sense. Um, you know, these are the the folks on the ground in the day to day with these individuals. And so to make that connection stronger and make those expectations greater, I think makes a whole lot of sense. Um, it's all happening in the community, right? <laughs> okay. So I'll much of it is. Um, forward. Go ahead. Sorry. Should I go forward? Yeah, please. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so a couple of points on goal two. So goal two is primary care, behavioral health, and pediatric care. Um, so specific to uh, to some of your interests, uh, we are overhauling the way we pay for primary care. Uh, so moving forward, all primary care in the ACO program, which is about one and a half million members currently, uh, will be capitated. And the idea behind this is that uh, we believe, and evidence shows in, in many other um, programs across the country and the world, um, that when you enable uh, capitation, um, in other words, giving a lump sum payment to a provider uh, and giving them goals to, uh, to attain, uh, they're more easily able to do that. So this will uh, extract them from the more standard fee-for-service mechanism, um, but it will also, uh, infuse over $115 million of new primary care investment uh, into this uh, program, and also ask uh, for higher expectations for the care that is being provided. Um, and a core focus of this, similar to uh, what I just said, will be around care coordination, on integrating that care within the primary care setting, on bringing more uh, behavioral health services into the primary care setting, uh, including, for example, services uh, for our members with autism, uh, intellectual disabilities, and or other disabilities, and centering those services more within the primary care home. Um, we are, are very optimistic about this program. This is uh, just a flag, the first time CMS has ever given a state the authority to do this. So we're uh, quite excited about 
uh, this is an opportunity to demonstrate that this, this can work better uh, for, for Medicaid members and, and hope to see it uh, replicated in other states in the future. This, um, uh, can I jump in, right? I'm sorry, this yeah. is yeah. such an important area, uh, especially for me since I am uh, very involved in health policy and training of future medical uh, doctors. Um, as you know, health equity for us really comes, the disparities there really come from a lack of access and we think also exposure and training for a lot of these um, doctors, and that is at times the reason why you know they are not as willing to take on patients. Um, is there anything uh, that's planned in terms of training? And although you mentioned the big investment in um, pediatric, you know we our community sees a huge gap in adult medicine, um, especially access to specialty care and primary care, really. Yeah, and, and I'm sorry. No, this is across the board, adults and kids. And, and to Catherine's uh, point in the chat, there is um, a lot of investment and, and um, similar work going on in, in the adult space as well. Um, okay. So I didn't mean to um, mischaracterize that. Um, behavioral health integration is, is across the board. So pediatric clinics as well as adult, adult okay. clinics. Um, and uh, significant investment across the board as well. Um, quickly to the workforce point, uh, and then I do want to move on because Heather has some, I think, uh, exciting and important eligibility pieces to, to hit on as well. Um, there's a lot going on in the workforce. Um, there, there's <laughs> the grayed out bullet, which I was going to skip over, but um, just to, to hit on quickly, we're, we're excited about. Uh, we got another close to $50 million of authority from CMS for uh, behavioral health and primary care loan repayment, nurse practitioner residencies in community settings, uh, a number of um, different types of behavioral health practitioners will, will um, be eligible for this. And this is in addition to uh, a lot more in ARPA, which I'm not actually including on this slide, but um, you guys have talked about ARPA before, so I, I know that's on your radar, but there's a lot of workforce initiative dollars coming out of ARPA as well, and this will complement those. So uh, it's high on our radar. We see it as a, a core priority, uh, both for Massachusetts, but also for the country, and um, is, a, is a huge bottleneck in terms of what we're able to provide on the ground. Oh, fantastic. Um, I'm going to quickly summarize the last two just to say that um, many of you may be familiar with the Roadmap for Behavioral Health Reform, which um, has been uh, an ongoing initiative of the Baker and Polito uh, administration. Uh, that is, the authority for the Behavioral Health Roadmap does not flow through the 1115. However, some of the activities that the Behavioral Health Roadmap have catalyzed needed be, uh, authority and or financing from the 1115, and we were able to get all of the authority and financing that we wanted. So um, just to hit on some of the high points, the Behavioral Health Roadmap is going to uh, create the new community behavioral health centers. Um, those will be up and running as of January uh, all throughout the state, providing uh, same day urgent uh, access to behavioral health services, adults and kids. Um, MCPAP for ASD, uh, for example, um, will be, uh, I don't believe that's January rollout, but that will be flowing through uh, CBHCs in addition to uh, its current uh, service delivery platforms as well. Um, so a lot of uh, robust activity in that space and the 1115 just gives us more uh, ability to, to really bolster those activities in the next five years. Uh, sorry, I won't interrupt too much more, but one, one other question about um... Uh, these behavioral health facilities, will they have access to ABA? I know McPAP has a lot of great services for kids. Um, so will there be like ABA, BCBAs, that kind of availability? So um, Mara, that is a, a slightly more nuanced question because okay. different CBHCs will have different levels of service delivery depending on how they're contracting. There is a bare minimum package, um, and I, I would have to talk to some of my BH colleagues. I don't want to misquote you on what ABA services are available across okay. all of them. We'll keep that one on, on our radar then. Yeah, sorry, I, I don't have that off the top of my head. That's okay. Um, but um, why don't we transition to the to the last slide, uh, and, and uh, Heather, I'll turn over to you. Thanks, Ryan. Hi, everyone. I'm Heather, um, and I am going to talk about an exciting eligibility um, change that we will be making to the Common Health program. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Common Health, which is uh, authorized through our, our 1115, and it provides um, comprehensive health care to individuals with disabilities. 
um, who are ineligible for our state plan um, coverage types. So these are typically people who are higher income and this provides a pathway for them to uh, access uh, comprehensive health coverage inclusive of LTSS, which is very important, um, I know, for, for this population in particular. So for the Common Health Program, uh, we have two paths um, that we pursued in the 1115, the first being for the under 65 population. So these are individuals who are ages 21 to 64. Um, they are individuals with disabilities and participating in the Common Health Program. The way that the Common Health Program is structured today is you identify as either working or not working. If you are working, then you have a, um, there is working criteria that is met as a condition of that eligibility. If you are not working, we have a structure called the one-time deductible, which is models itself after the Medicaid uh, spend down. So it is, uh, it uses the excess income um, as a uh, and calculates that as a deductible, which is then used to offset that, um, so that you be, you are within the allowable income limits. So basically, whatever you're over, that's going to be your spend down amount. You are going to incur those uh, that amount in medical expenses over a six month program. When you do and you provide that verification to us, we will activate your Common Health. And you will have it going forward there. Um, it, it, this is not a recurring deductible. It, um, it is just that one time that you need to meet it. For the under 65 population, both the one time deductible and the, um, the condition of uh, working hours are being eliminated. So those will no longer be conditions of gaining access to the common health program. Um, therefore, you will follow the standard eligibility rules. You will meet the financial criteria uh, and the categorical eligibility criteria. Um, and if your income is over 150% of the federal poverty level, you will still be assessed a premium. However, you will no longer have to meet those ad that additional criteria um, and have that segregation between working and not working for uh, the under 65 population. So we're very excited about this. It's going to greatly improve uh, access to the Common Health Program. For the over 65 population, which is the second path we pursued, we currently offer for individuals who continue working over the age of 65, they, can, um, they have a pathway to access Common Health benefits, also authorized through our 1115. Um, it is similar, it follows the same methodology as the under 65. Uh, so all the rules are the same, but you have to be working in order uh, to access that. We did not have a parallel track for individuals who were not working. So if once they turned 65, if they were not working, then they would become subject to our non-MAGI eligibility, which is substantially different. And non-MAGI is our traditional age-blind disabled population um, with stricter eligibility rules. So they're tended to we tended to see a lot of people fall off at that point um, because they were no longer eligible for Medicaid due to the lower income threshold as well as the asset test. Now Common Health will be available for both working and non-working individuals over the age of 65 without an asset test provided they are ineligible for standard. So we'll do the standard assessment. If you are not eligible, then we will assess you for Common Health. And if you meet the criteria, then you will be able to access that. One caveat for the, the non-working individuals is they, we are, um, there is a participation um, requirement. So we are looking at individuals who have been participating with the program for 10 years um, in order to continue down that path once they turn 65. So that is the, the only caveat. Um, we are in the process of developing the operational protocols for, uh, for implementing both of these pieces. And we look forward to continuing to provide updates as we roll this out. Fantastic. Um, I'll, I'll stop the share now. Um,
Thank you so much for sharing. And I know that there's even more information and I'm going to send out the entire slide deck um, for people that haven't taken a look at that. And, um, and also I am very glad to take additional questions after people have a chance to uh, review those slides. And then if I need help, I will reach out to you all. Um, but yeah, very grateful for all of this work and for your time. I did want to just ask quick before the, the time runs out. Um, I had read a little bit about, and I just wanted you to uh, mention a little about the stakeholder involvement in this and then kind of going forward, how stakeholders are are involved in and, you know, are we defined as, as part of that? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. So um, just to recap, this was actually the process of about three years of work. It was supposed to only be two, but then you may have heard there was a global pandemic and things got a, a little bit delayed. Um, but uh, we had, um, I, I, I lost count well into the triple digits numbers of um, both procured as well as uh, public meetings uh, with stakeholders. There were three uh, procured stakeholder groups to develop the strategy that went into uh, the 1115 um, with over 100, 150 members um, procured from across the state. And then we had, I think, half a dozen um, public meetings leading up to the submission last year. Uh, we So now that things are approved, um, CMS, as a part of this, requires um, multiple protocols and implementation plans and uh, additional kind of documentation and, and strategic planning to implement all of the things that are in the waiver. Uh, and those are, that's kind of our next 12 months. Um, so that will take us the better part of a year actually to, uh, to, to complete all of that strategic planning. There will be throughout that process, multiple opportunities for uh, folks to engage on different stages of that. Um, in full transparency, we're still actually developing that process because uh, we have to kind of construct that process based on what the CMS timeline is. Um, but there will be multiple opportunities in the coming uh, six to 12 months um, to, to engage on a number of these aspects. Um, and uh, certainly we're, we're happy to share that information as, as we are releasing it. Fantastic. Uh, Ryan, I know you, you need to jump. We, I don't know if Heather has two more minutes to stay on. <laughs> Um, we thank just have one so more much. question. Yeah, <laughs> but thank you so much for coming and for all your work. Take care. Right. Heather, I see there's a question. I thought of this one too about the one time spend down and does that uh, go away after the first year? Yeah, so we're still working on fleshing out the details. There's a lot of system changes that have to be made in order to support this. Uh, so we are working through that right now. We do have a major release scheduled at the end of the year, which is going to accomplish a good portion of implementation. So we, um, we are anticipating sometime in January, um, we will have partial implementation. There are still gonna be components that we need to work through um, because we do have two eligibility systems. So the HICS, which is our under 65 online system, uh, that release is scheduled for the end of the year, um, but we do need to make changes to our other uh, system, MA21, which is our over 65 population. So we're working as quickly as we can to figure out when we um, to schedule those system releases and whether or not there are mm -hmm. procedures or protocols that we need to put in place in the interim to, to support implementation of this. Um, so as, as, these, uh, as the news evolves, we'll continue to share that with folks. Uh, do I have a moment to just announce some good news I just got from Anna? Sure. Um, SDM just passed in the Senate. Fantastic. <laughs> we were waiting to hear that. I didn't want to confirm until until I, I just got the it. message. Just happened a few minutes ago. I just got an email from Anna yeah. saying that. Fantastic. So that was a, a, a great uh, effort over multiple sessions. So we're really happy to see that. Um, does anybody have any other questions for Heather? That was really informative and really good for me just to wrap my head around those changes in a more succinct way. So uh, really appreciate you and Ryan's time. Yeah, thank you so much for having us today. Okay, maybe we'll check in again uh, in past January and see how things are going with implementation. Sounds great. Look forward to it. Take care.
Well, thank you, everybody. I will send along those slides. And um, if you missed the very beginning of this uh, webinar, we did talk about the economic development bill moving and Chapter 257 having those funds that were initially put in the bill um, remained. So uh, that's really good news. And uh, stay tuned because we'll break down exactly what that means for the workforce and the rates and give you confirmation when it, you know, is ready to hit the governor's desk. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you, everybody. I, uh, very exciting news about supported decision making and, you know, stay tuned because we may have one or two more bills going through the informal. So um, thanks and have a good rest of the week. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.